My story begins with three seemingly unrelated things. Bill and Melinda Gates and condoms. <laughs> yep, you heard right, condoms. And yes, they actually have something in common. Let me explain. Bill and Melinda Gates have a strong desire to make the world a better place. So they formed the Gates Foundation in 2000. Its mission is to support new research endeavors to tackle some of the most pressing issues facing our world today in order to improve the quality of life for all people. One of these issues is the spread of sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, and HIV. Did you know one million STIs are acquired every single day worldwide? 37 million people are currently living with HIV around the world. And here in the US, there is 2.7 million STI diagnoses just in 2017 alone. And that's actually at a record high. Now, these numbers are absolutely shocking. So the VA Foundation asked, how can we reduce these STI transmission rates? Condoms, right? That's how. I mean, condoms are really effective in preventing the spread of STIs, and they can help with family planning. Huge plus. I mean, they're globally accessible, they're cheap to produce, and they can combat these issues. But here's the reality. People don't like wearing condoms. Sex without condoms is viewed as more pleasurable. So in 2013, the Gates Foundation put out a grant call and challenged innovators around the globe to make a better condom. They thought, if we can design a better condom that people would actually like, perhaps this would encourage more people to use them. Now this is where I come in. With support from the Gates Foundation grant, my team of chemists, material scientists, engineers, and clinicians were challenged to innovate the condom. We recognize that one of the biggest issues to condom usage is that condoms are just not lubricated sufficiently, and that's actually leading to loss of discomfort and dissatisfaction for both men and women. So, as the lead chemist on the team, we were set on our journey to make the self-lubricating condom. Now, as a scientist, I was so excited to work on such a challenging material science problem but I have to admit, it was such a daunting task to try to improve such a well-known product that hasn't seen innovation in over 60 years. And this got me thinking about innovation in general. I mean, people have great ideas all the time, but the journey to make innovation happen can be incredibly taxing. What makes one idea work? Well, others don't. Well. Let me share my lessons and insights with you based on my own innovation journey. So when I started my journey, I was no condom expert. In fact, I really had no idea where to start. So I decided to start my condom education at a place where I knew I could find all the answers. Target. <laughs> so off to Target I went. There, I walked past the automatic doors grabbed the plastic red basket, and headed straight to the infamous condom aisle. And there was every single type of condom imaginable there. I mean, there's condoms in different colors and funny shapes and all different sizes. I saw glow-in-the-dark condoms and polka dot at ones and one with different flavors. And I got my hand on every single type I could find and put them into my basket until it was full. Afterwards, I immediately ran to the straight-out counter and even smiled at the guy behind me as he disapprovingly looked down at me in my basket full of 20 boxes of condoms. It's for research, I said to him, <laughs> before I headed out the door. So after my target trip, I now needed to learn about material sciences and coatings. So for months, I consumed every scientific article and textbook on the topic before I was ready to begin experimenting. Finally, in the lab, I tried many different things. I mean, I dissolved reagents my mother couldn't pronounce. I heated solutions up. I cooled others down. Days went by, 
and then weeks went by, and nothing worked. Now, as a scientist, I knew research takes time and patience, <laughs> but oh boy, I did not realize how long this was going to take at first. By now, months were flashing by, and then a year passes before my eyes. And still, nothing worked. And I was really frustrated, and I just kind of want to give up at this point. And the worst part of all this is that these struggles was just the beginning of my journey. And I was, as I was trying to overcome these scientific hurdles, it felt like climbing Mount Everest, where every single day was just a brand new snowstorm, trying to steer you off the track to the summit. But the summit was so, so far away, and I was already so, so weary. But just like research, innovation takes patience, it takes focus, and a lot of discipline. Innovation isn't created in an instant. It needs that struggle, it needs that time, and it needs that effort. I mean, Marie Curie didn't come up with radiation in a week, right? So, I wouldn't either. And this brings me to my first takeaway lesson, which is this. We have to rely on good old-fashioned grit to be close by our sides, to push us through these taxing moments, because innovation needs grit to thrive. And these struggles could actually be, actually be really good for us and for innovation. They can serve as a sign for us to pivot and to think of other creative solutions that might work. And <laughs> oh boy, did we try some really crazy things. <laughs> so over the two years we spent developing the prototype, I tried over a thousand different formulations. Literally 1,000 formulations. I actually still have my lab notebook to prove it. Every day, I remembered going to lab, setting up the containers, filling them up with liquids, testing them, and then just throwing them all in the trash at the end of the day. Failure. I would then go home, have a glass of wine, and just repeat that process again the next day. I was so desperate to make this work that this problem started consuming my life. Condoms and chemistries and coatings were constantly on my mind from the moment I got up in the morning until the moment I went to bed every single day. Now at this time, my team and I were disgruntled. We were hopeless, discouraged. None of the obvious solutions were working and I was so hungry for new inspiration. I was so desperate then when I saw a bottle of Elmer's glue, I even thought, oh, this might work. So picture this. There was I in the lab, opening a jar of Elmer's glue and just smearing it all over a condom. And then I just remembered asking myself, Stacy, what are you doing? <laughs> and it didn't work. No surprise there. But as weird and insane as that was, that incident actually forced me to think of other solutions that might work. I started to think of the other non-obvious choices. And so with this new refreshed mindset, I went back into the lab with this new perspective, and I started to think outside the box. So one afternoon, two years in, I decided to try just one more thing. I opened up the last page of my third notebook, I jot down some notes. I mentally prepared myself for another failed experiment. And then I mustered the courage to head back into the lab. There, I mixed some solutions together, slabbed it on the condom surface, went to the sink, grabbed some water, wetted the condom, touched it with my fingers, and it was slippery. And oh, I freaked out. And at this realization, I remember running straight to my co-founder, and I told him, I think we may have something. I was really surprised that this coding worked, because this formula was not obvious to me at first. But this incident actually taught me to stay open-minded to new ideas and perspectives that may seem unlikely to work at first. And this brings me to my second takeaway lesson, which is this. Sometimes, 
innovation isn't obvious and that we have to force ourselves to think outside the box in order to think of other creative solutions that might work. So once we got going in the lab and finally had a prototype that actually worked with our new secret sauce, we were so excited to share it with the world. So we started talking to investors and customers and end users. But the more I told people about our self-lubricating condom and how it could address problems with condom lubricity and usage, I began to realize there was a difference in the, some, in the way some people reacted in these meetings. I mean, this issue affects both men and women, but their experiences with condoms are so, so different. So they don't see the exact same problem in the exact same way. For instance, nearly every time when I pitch this condom technology to some men, they typically respond with, really? That's interesting. Can you tell me more about this lubrication problem? And then I have to spend another 10 minutes telling them more about the issue and its impact on global health. But when I give the exact same pitch to other, some women, they lean in and they listen with encouragement and they respond with, I can totally see that being a problem. I completely understand. So now I'm a bit confused and frustrated as to why some didn't see the importance of our technology as others did. And as I was trying to think of different ways to reach out to these investors and customers, I thought back to those really powerful stories that people have shared with me in the past. For instance, after pitching our technology at an event, a middle-aged woman immediately ran after me, frantically to tell me how excited she was to learn about her self-lubricating condom. She was having problems being intimate with her husband to the, point, to the point when her marriage was falling apart. At another event, a younger woman in her mid-20s told me she was actually allergic to personal lubricant products on the market because of all the harsh chemicals in them. And she really hoped that our product would be a solution for herself and others liked her. So now, armed with these stories, I started using them when pitching our condom technologies to investors and customers. And I found, by putting a face to a problem, by telling stories of personal struggles, and by creating context for my audience, they began to recognize the importance of our technology for condom usage and lubrication. And I found, by using these stories to educate others, I actually took away some of the reluctance of my audience, and they began to believe me. Sometimes, we have to decenter ourselves from our own experiences and to seek other stories to get a more holistic perspective of the challenges in front of us. And this brings me to my third takeaway message, which is this. Wherever you guys may be in your own innovation journey, look for the perspectives that are not necessarily your own and use those stories to educate and communicate to the world why your innovation is important and necessary. So I hope these three takeaway lessons I shared with you today gives you some insight as to what I believe innovation needs to thrive. I mean, innovation is difficult, but it is through innovation that we can solve some of the most pressing issues facing our world today. So to my fellow scientists, dreamers, entrepreneurs, and innovators, keep going. What you're doing is so important, and don't give up. We all have the power to make these really big ideas come to life. And in my case, I'm really hopeful that we can reduce the number of people living with HIV and STI around the world. One condom at a time. Thank you.